Well, thank you, Eric, and really to the whole ASEA team for putting together the event. Um, a lot of hard work goes into creating something like this, and they did a very nice job of, of getting us all together. So the title of our conference, Powertrain Options for Commercial Vehicles. This might sound self-evident, and to some of you it is in the room, but to others it sounds a little bit like industry jargon. What are commercial vehicles anyways? And really, what are powertrain options at the end of the day? As you saw outside the museum, commercial vehicles include all the shapes and sizes that were there. Buses, vans, light trucks, heavy trucks, and the full complement of motive power for them. They all do have, though, one thing which is important in common, and that is really their commercial use. So in other words, these are vehicles that we in society put to work for large and small businesses, and they in essence drive our economy. Or in other cases, they take us to work in the public sector, and they can deliver essential services for all of our citizens. This comes from the truck that's bringing fruits and vegetables to our doors or to our supermarkets, or the vans that deliver parcels, or the buses that drive us to work in the morning. All of them fit in the commercial vehicle space. So for the sake of simplicity, we split these missions into two categories for our discussions today. Long haul and regional transport of goods on the one hand, and the urban transport of goods or people on the other. That's the vehicle definition. What about the powertrains? Well, obviously, these are the very hearts of the vehicles, and they're what drives our trucks and our vans and our buses to make sure that they do their jobs efficiently and effectively. And as we already mentioned, there are an infinite array of opportunities for how the powertrain is working. This is from conventional powertrains running on diesel or petrol to alternative drives running on biofuels, natural gas, hydrogen, as well as electric and hybrid electric technologies. And the combination of all the different commercial vehicles together with the wide range of powertrain options leads to this endless array of choices that we're gonna to discuss today. Some of the vehicles that are on display outside today, if you haven't already done so, I think almost everybody had the chance to, but I hope you, if you didn't get to, you get to go out during the break with a hot coffee or a cup of hot chocolate and walk around the mood of winter and enjoy the vehicles firsthand. Talk to the experts that are with those vehicles and find out more about the key technologies that are driving our entire economy. In line with our customers' interests and the objectives of the European Commission's mobility package, we want to explore the potential of the full range of powertrain options that contribute to these operating efficiencies and further decarbonize the world. Of course, this is an extremely relevant topic. No doubt you've all been reading recent reports in the media public announcements on the future of diesel or the expected e-mobility revolutions. But some of the media writing about this and some of the policymakers that are talking about it, and in fact, some of the industry people talking about it, are doing so largely from the perspective of passenger vehicles. As you understand, trucks, vans, and buses fulfill far more diverse and unique cases as compared to a car. That's why we believe it's important and timely to have this discussion on the subject from the perspective of commercial vehicles. So what powertrain options work best for the commercial vehicles? Gosh, it would be so much better if there was one simple answer. But unsurprisingly, there is no simple answer, as it depends on the intended use of the vehicle. There are, however, several criteria which we all agree must be considered when deciding if a technology is the right choice for a commercial vehicle. I'll now briefly introduce them. First and foremost, and it must always be treated as first and foremost, is safety. Any and all technologies must be safe for the person operating the vehicle and for the everyone within the operating environment. There can be no compromise on this point. Secondly, cost. Specifically, the cost of owning and operating the vehicle. In this area, Fuel costs, whether they are for diesel, petrol, gas, electrical energy, or a combination of fuel sources, is the single biggest operating cost. And at the end of the day, the cost of operating commercial vehicles is important to every one of us, as this is included in the price of the items we buy. Whether it's the food we eat, 
the clothes we wear, and in fact, indeed, almost everything we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Thirdly, the environment. Decarbonizing the environment is important to all of us. We all share the world we live in, and we want a healthy environment not just for ourselves, but also for those around us and our families and for future generations. Wonderfully, this is a great thing, wonderfully, decarbonizing road transport and reducing costs are in complete alignment. So we as an industry and with policymakers should seek the very same objectives here. This is because consuming less fuel cuts operating costs and reduces CO2. If commercial viability is considered, then policymakers and industry will be in perfect alignment. Reliability and durability. Clearly, in an economy that is based on just-in-time deliveries, the reliability and durability of technology has to be a key factor. Any new technology must demonstrate maximum reliability. The wide-scale introduction of technologies before they are ready would really benefit no one in the long run. Range of the vehicles is a factor. In other words, how far the vehicle can travel before it needs to be refueled or recharged is important. The suitability of the technology for the different use cases you saw outside has different answers. For example, using electrical power for a vehicle operating in urban environments can make a lot of sense. However, a scenario where electrical power is the right choice for a 40-ton vehicle operating between, say, Spain and Hamburg in Germany is much less likely in the midterm or even possibly in the long term. Another factor is load capacity. Obviously, each technology brings with it a different volume and weight. And this is important as the weight and volume of technology affects the payload or the passenger space available for the vehicle. And we move to infrastructure. For all power choices, there needs to be an adequate infrastructure that is available. This should not be overlooked. Infrastructure ranges in complexity from the continuation of low sulfur fuel, something that's readily available for us today, to the availability of electrical charging stations and compressed or liquefied natural gas fueling stations. It really should even cover the capability of the electrical grid to cope with demand if high volumes of electrically powered vehicles are introduced to the market. There's a lot of press about electrical vehicle charging and we need to be mindful of the capabilities of our society right now and the cost impacts it has for our society. So with all these criteria in mind, we want to explore what are the right short, mid, and long-term power choices for different types of commercial vehicles. As manufacturers, we have the know-how to produce ever cleaner diesel vehicles, as well as the full range of alternative powertrains. And as evidence of this, the vehicles are parked outside the museum today. But for sure, we need to have a market for what we produce. And during our discussions, you'll hear more about this from the perspective of truck, van, and bus manufacturers for what makes a market viable. And at the end of the day, that market viability is based upon customers. Why do more than 90% of the buses and vans and more than 98% of the heavy duty trucks continue to run on diesel? Are our customers willing to purchase alternatively powered vehicles? If so, what are the circumstances that will help them make those choices? If not, what's preventing them from those choices? And what would it take to have them change their minds? For each of our panel discussions later on, we've invited end users of the vehicles to tell us more about their experiences. And of course, policymakers play a critical role. It's very important that we work with the European Parliament and Commission, both DG Move and DG Grow, to make sure that we work together to determine the future of commercial powertrains. Ladies and gentlemen, as an industry, we have three relevant considerations that I'd like to share with you. I come back around first to infrastructure. Truck drivers simply cannot be in a situation where they find themselves unable to recharge or refuel a vehicle quickly or easily. Europe needs a more complete and consistent recharging and refueling infrastructure before we can expect operators to think about buying alternatively powered vehicles. A 
ASEA therefore supports the Commission's action plan for boosting investment in charging and refueling stations throughout the EU. The second recommendation is support structures. The affordability of alternatively powered vehicles is key, as operators simply have to make money with their vehicles. Taxation policies, incentives, and public procurement can be useful tools to stimulate the sale of alternatively powered vehicles. But it's crucial that there's an independent commercial path to success where the technology simply will not last in the marketplace. Thirdly, and this is probably the key takeaway for us, we must ensure technology neutral policies. There is no one technology that can satisfy the needs of all commercial vehicles. Not every powertrain is ideal for all the tasks. So it's not possible to designate a single technology for a particular vehicle, let alone an entire vehicle class. The choice should ultimately be commercially determined by the customer based on his or her specific and unique needs, as well as the overall benefit to society. Policy must recognize and support this market-based approach. So with the right commercial conditions in place, over time, the market will shift to alternatively powered commercial vehicles, particularly and first in the urban environments. In parallel, we believe that the latest generation of diesel technology delivering low CO2 emissions and low real world pollutant levels will continue to be the powertrain choice for many of the use cases that exist, specifically things like the long haul delivery of goods. Before I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to point out that although this event focuses on powertrain options, this is not the only way forward in decarbonizing road transport. There are many other high potential measures, such as weights and dimensions legislations to improve fuel efficiency, truck platooning, fleet renewal, maintenance of road infrastructure, driver training, and load optimization, all of which can play a significant role. And so as we get started, I'd like to invite you to sit back, relax, and watch a short animated film, which I think does a very good job of bringing to life the issues that are at stake. Thank you and enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>